We're going to start. Um, we have uh, just had an executive session, and so um, we're already in session. Um, but we're going to start with administrative business, which is agenda item number two. Um, the calendar is here. Uh, we have a variety of subcommittee meetings before the end of the year. Uh, the only one that's changed is finance. Everything else, I think, is uh, straightforward. Um, we do have a public hearing tonight with the Board of Selectmen on the 9th Elementary School, and then we'll have a joint meeting to deliberate further on December 15th, which is a Tuesday, um, just so everybody's clear that's a Tuesday. We will also still be meeting that Thursday. Um, any additions to the calendar? Squinting eyes. Okay, um, good. So we have a consent agenda. Um, we have some past records and the establishment of a uh, the Peter McNulty Memorial Scholarship. Um, do I have a motion? Ms. Stram, seconded by Ms. Stone. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Terrific. Um, uh, subcommittee reports. Finance. Ms. Stram, and you do have an agenda item yes. a little bit later, so. The uh, Finance Subcommittee met earlier this week to discuss uh, the first quarter report, which we will talk about later in our agenda. Um, we also uh, recommended that two financial policies be reviewed by the Policy Subcommittee. Uh, they were the Financial Assistance Policy and the Student Fees and Fines Policy. Um, so we'll be discussing those later down the line in, in that subcommittee before they come to the full committee. Uh, the uh, final update is that we will review a first draft of the budget in our meeting on December 18th, which, as Susan just mentioned, was, was moved, so please make note of the new date and time. Um, and a few things to just highlight that, that will be different in terms of how we look at the report, um, that the budget will be reformatted to match the format of how the town's financials are prepared so that you can more easily connect the two. Um, we will also be preparing the budget to uh, look at the numbers in one view instead of multiple views. I know that we've in the past sliced and diced the budget in many different ways and, and that made it a little harder for people to connect the dots and, and understand how everything adds up and, and so we're looking to streamline and, and simplify um, and finally, there'll be a new addition to uh, the budget, which will um, show how personnel um, or the, the budget is broken down by different bargaining units. So those are sort of new changes that, that you all should expect to see when we uh, review the draft at the end of this month. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, capital improvements? <clears throat> um, as we saw on the calendar, the the uh, capital subcommittee will be meeting a week from tomorrow at 8 a.m. And um, so there isn't a report from the committee. Um, the obviously uh, lots still going on in in uh, in town hall and in town around the ninth school study, and we're going to take that up with the board of selectmen shortly later this evening. But there is some news, which is that the uh, lease for the devotion school. K to four uh, uh, building, uh, Lower Devo on Webster Street, we might call it. I don't know if anybody's calling it that yet. Um, the lease was signed, and I think I, I would ask the superintendent to um, to give us a little bit of a report on that. The uh, signing of the lease was a long process, and uh, as David said, we're very pleased it was executed last week. Uh, and what it does for us, it gives us some safeguards moving forward as we, we try to build out that property to be a temporary school for the next two years during the construction phase of the Devotion School. Some of the important aspects of that lease are that the, all the construction documents will be completed by December 23rd. So uh, not only uh, the building committee, but also uh, the town's engineers and the town's inspectors, inspectors will have all the construction documents uh, in, in, within a few weeks. And also the, the owner's contractor has agreed to build out a mock classroom. So he's actually going to take one, some space in that building that wouldn't be ready for, uh, for us to look at until the spring. 
but he's going to take one of one or two of the spaces and actually build a mock classroom so we can go in this month before the, uh, the vacation period and actually view what the classroom will what a classroom will look like so the devotion teachers and administrators will have a chance to go over look at this classroom make recommendations of where they want their teaching wall where they want their IT drops and that'll be very helpful to make sure that when the project is completed in the spring it meets our needs and it's what we want uh, the con actual construction phase will take place from February to May we will take occupancy on May 16th which will really give us the, uh, June July and August to uh, do the finishing details to create that school atmosphere for the devotion K4 population so that's all good news the other thing I might mention David is uh, uh, the capital committee has been really analyzing these projections we talked about a few weeks ago in, in great detail and we're still working on it but we feel that uh, by analyzing it we'll be able to identify well in advance where the classroom shortages will be due to enrollment increasing over the next five years until a night school is on online and we'll be able to give the building department uh, a great deal of time to anticipate where the needs are and so we hope to have this analyzed within a few weeks and we're already started doing some uh, on-site tours for what, we're, what we have already projected as our needs for next year in some of the schools with the classroom shortfall due to enrollment increase that's about it great any questions Okay, the only thing other that I'll note is I saw an email in my inbox today that we have a fully f executed project funding agreement for the devotion project. So that's very exciting. We're getting instructions on how to enter project budgets into the MSBA system, which is always a good sign. So in addition to that, we uh, the devotion project is out for um, uh, estimates to our cost estimators right now um, for just and it's due tomorrow uh, there'll be some reconciliation uh, between the two uh, groups that are doing the cost estimates and we will be meeting on uh, December 14th in the morning to to find out the results of that and whether or not we're going to have to do some value engineering or not so keep tuned okay Cur tuned. curriculum Ms. Charlevsky uh, um, so also there's a meeting on the 16th um, the agenda is a little bit to be decided, but uh, what, depending on when we get the, um, if we get the accountability numbers from the state or not, um, if we do, that may bump some of it. But right now, what we have planned is the technology um, update, the uh, senior class paper um, uh, discussion with um, Deb Holman and Mary Bershnoff from the high school and um, a sort of preview of uh, the high school um, uh, school improvement plan. So that's what we'll be discussing. Okay, great. Uh, government relations, we have um, a first reading. Ms. Stone. <coughs> Chair, um, in front of you uh, are, is a, um, for first reading, um, a draft of our legislative priorities document um, that uh, when we have approved it which I hope we will at our next meeting in December um, will be the document that we share ahead of our legislative breakfast with our team of legislative representatives from the State House and Senate um, the uh, those of you who were uh, with us last year will recognize um, the the issues that were raised the specific legislative issues that were raised um, the introduction was changed obviously to uh, to reflect um, where we are in our enrollment growth but also to reflect the override um, and the challenges that continue to face us in terms of um, responding to growth the legislative priorities are really not about our key issue on growth um, and so uh, what this is essentially saying is um, is saying that while we are focused very clearly um, for now on continuing 
our, the school system uh, in the context of um, all of these changes that, it, that, that doesn't diminish our interest in the legislation. It may diminish our ability to do a lot of work on it. Um, but we still want to hear from uh, we still want to hear from our legislators about where these pieces of legislation fit in their priorities in what they think is going to happen in the second session of the legislature that starts in January, um, particularly around uh, the issues that we have been working with them on for some years now, the transportation um, adding uh, transportation costs to the circuit breaker calculation. Um, the trigger for what uh, what allows local districts to get um, a reimbursement or from the circuit breaker for um, for high cost uh, special education. Um, we uh, we thought it was important to thank our legislators who were very very involved um, last year in sustaining and getting a slight increase actually for us on the Medco program. Um, especially in light of the conversation that this town had around METCO during the override um, and leading up to the override. So um, we want to talk to them about that, certainly thank them and, and talk to them about um, <coughs> just reflect on what happens, which is what happened in Brookline was exactly what we kept on predicting would happen um, as METCO gets chiseled or the METCO funding gets chiseled away. Um, and so, um, so that is still on our legislative um, priorities list. Um, the third one is, uh, again, continuing the conversation about mandate relief. We Every year we talk about the growing pressure on our budget, our administrators, our educators um, from both federal and, in particular, state mandates to implement new curriculum programs or services. Um, each year that we have this conversation, our legislators are very, very sympathetic, and each year the legislat legislature passes new um, curricular mandates. Um, uh, and while we, every single time we talk to our legislative delegation about this, we explain that we don't object in principle to many of these mandates. We think some of the curricular changes have been excellent. We have, uh, we have been happy to uh, move forward. Um, the most recent one this year was, uh, was a new um, law mandating um, uh, sex education curriculum. Um, Brookline happily uh, is in a position of already being um, in compliance with with that, but it's uh, it's the fact that it's being legislated rather than um, rather than developed, and again, um, uh, and and being legislated without uh, commensurate support for the implementation of those curricula. Um, Fourth, the, uh, the issue that we've talked about again for many years that our, our delegates have, um, have actually introduced legislation on our behalf on health insurance coverage, coverage for medically necessary treatment in school. Um, we will undoubtedly have a very similar conversation about that as we have in the past, but it's good to, for us to keep on talking about it. Um, and reaffirming our support for legislation that, that, uh, that we have, again, interest in looking at long-term um, revising the foundation budget to reflect real costs. That's something that there was a, a committee that reported on this year to the legislatures. It would be interesting to see what our, our delegates think, our, del our representatives believe will happen with those recommendations. Um, the tuition increases at out-of-district private schools for special needs um, continues to be um, a source of um, budget pressure. Um, and uh, continuing the funding for what we now refer to as true universal pre-K. Um, thank you, Ms. Trelupski, um, and the support for full-day kindergarten implementation um, in the district. Um, we added uh, this year, um, because, uh, because it is such a, a, a big and public issue and because we know they will be considering H340, the proposed moratorium on high-stakes use of standardized tests, we included not as a priority because the school committee was divided um, in its vote over that, but, um, <coughs> but we wanted to acknowledge that we took a vote on it um, in terms of the Warren article, that we were divided and attached to these priorities our unanimously endorsed statement on standardized testing so that we can have that conversation with um, our legislators as well. Um, I think it's important to recognize that um, Frank Smizek um, is one of the sponsors of H340, and so um, I also believe it will be um, uh, good to have that conversation directly with him um, about 
where we were, what the concerns were, and, and also get a sense of, of what may happen with that, especially in light of uh, the U.S. House of Representatives um, action on, uh, on no child, finally putting a, a lid on No Child Left Behind and, and moving us forward um, and putting some, uh, at least it's being characterized in the press as um, moving back to uh, more local control um, of certain uh, standards. So um, I think that conversation will be, will be interesting. Um, and although because our space issues are not legislative issues, um, but I don't believe that uh, that our uh, the opportunity to speak with our legislators should um, miss um, the chance to discuss with them what's happening with space issues and our relationship with the state and what they can do with us um, to try to move uh, move forward that agenda as well. So I look forward to that. I'm happy to take any questions about this. I want to thank Mr. Olepsky and Ms. Scotto for. Uh, joining me in um, reviewing and putting them together, putting together the first draft, and uh, happy to take um, wordsmithing offline, um, but major substantive questions um, here so that we can move to second reading. I hope. Questions for Ms. Dunn? Uh, I'll just add two. One is that um, the timing's a little odd because um, we're going to be sending this. We may be sending this before we know what happens to the statement of interest before the MSBA for the high school. However, they will be, we will be talking to them, I would hope, after we have an answer. So it might be worth just acknowledging that we are hoping to learn the answer before we actually meet with them. Um, that's one. Um, and number two, um, it just struck me that in, on the high stakes testing um, paragraph, I think there were some very valuable concerns raised about not having high stakes tests. And so I'm wondering if there's some way to say some of the concerns raised were about not having standard, about not having high stakes tests were X, Y, and Z. And we hope to have a robust discussion about how not to take our eye off the ball in terms of equity, in terms of accountability. I mean, just basically there were some important values that were that we want to make sure continue even if this legislation has passed. Um, and, and most of that's on the second page, but the second page is a more general statement that doesn't necessarily have to do with the legislation. So I guess the question is, is it worth reflecting more of what what we fundamentally hope to see? So what so what I reflected in in this document was the conversation that we had at the table about the possibility of H340 being amended. Um, to reflect just that conversation that we had um, and to address educational equity and the role, again, of student assessment, including standardized testing and promoting a culture of accountability. I, I thought that that was reflecting what you okay. raised. If you feel that it should be done differently, okay. I'm happy to take that as a, as a consideration. And other people might have more specific language other. than I do. It's just more of a general sense. And this we could do the wordsmith offline, but it might be worth okay. Yeah. You know, be happy to take suggestions um, for people who think that there's a different way to articulate that. I, I think the important part is that this is the starting off point to discuss it with the legislators, and all those issues will come up at the meeting, I assume. I don't think that anybody's going to be shy about talking about, you know, their thoughts about what the vote was and what, what, what their ideas are. So. Okay, then no, that's helpful. I just don't know if, if anybody has more specific thoughts. They can just send them to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you have just, I mean, thoughts, no. Thoughts you should express here. But okay, right. Specific language. Language. Subject to, I mean, in, in response to what um, the chair was, was raising, and you have ideas for language that would work for you better than the language that's here around those issues, I would love to see that. So that is our first reading. We shall leave it there. Thank you very much. Yes, Miss Coyne. Yeah, second reading <laughs> on the 17th. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for shepherding this, um, as always. Uh, policy review, Dr. Jackson, and I think. Okay. Yeah. We're going to, because we're going to have a, um, a school committee action later on that talks about a policy specific policy, there isn't a particular 
Do you want to just do a I just want to do a quick yeah, okay, FYI perfect, and then we um so first I just want to make sure everybody is aware that the date that's on the calendar is a new date. It was the tenth and is now the ninth at eight thirty. So I just want to make sure folks caught that. Oh, what's not a typo. <laughs> um at that meeting we'll be discussing um the new regulations um and requirements for our restraint policy. We'll be reviewing an initial draft of the language that's required now by law to go into that policy um, and figure out um, how to move so that we are in compliance by the first of the year, both in terms of the policy and also the procedures for that particular policy. And then um, the other thing we'll be talking about is the um, finance assistant policy we'll we'll review that do an initial review um, at that meeting um, given how our meetings go those are the only two things I hope to cover um, <laughs> um, and depending on how the conversation goes tonight with regards to the admissions policy we may or may not um, need to leave time for that as well so um, that's it any questions okay uh, the superintendent transition process um, so since the last meeting we have I think since the last meeting we've actually hired um, a uh, an executive search consultant by the name of Jim Hughey, um of Atlantic Research um, we're delighted thank you to Helen and Barbara and Lisa and Re uh, Rebecca who all um, shepherded us through that process um, and got us to a great point and thank you also to Dave Janikakis and uh, Mary Ellen Dunn who who worked their magic um, to, to make it all come together in a pretty uh, short period of time, uh, relatively speaking, for government processes. Um, always have to get that out there. Uh, and so we're delighted. Um, Jim's terrific. Um, he Skypes with us often, uh, and he's a lot of, and he's funny. Um, and he's really committed to transparency and um, openness. Um, and a lot of public process, which is uh, great for us. It's it's very Brookline. Um, and so uh, the other thing that's happened is um, Dr. Jackson has agreed to um, be voluntold uh, to uh, to be our coordinator um, on the superintendent search. Um, we are we're not going to be forming a separate superintendent search committee. And so um, Dr. Jackson is going to um, wave her hands like this, much like a conductor, and all kinds of magic will happen. Um, do you do you want to give just a couple? minutes about where we are in terms of the the principles and then some of the the key activities that we're happy to and i would love to put on our next uh school committee meeting agenda a chance to give a fuller update um because by then there will be more to talk about um we're really excited to be working with jim he's great he's incredibly open and also incredibly connected um nationally to lots of amazing people and so we are excited to tap his networks and he's already demonstrated that he's got a crack team behind him who has helped us develop an advertisement um, and get that out and so for folks who are interested in seeing it it is online it should be i believe where's ben is it on our website now not yet shortly maybe before you leave tonight okay um, but it has been posted in ed week and a couple of other national um sites and um for those who may dismay that it doesn't feel Full. It's because it's meant to tickle people's interests. It's not meant to be the full job description, um, but it is meant to say, hello, we are hiring. We're a great place to come and be a superintendent. Please give us a call and check it out. And so um, Jim has, in fact, already started to get some responses to that ad. And so um, it's clearly doing its job. Um, the other thing that will happen in short order um, as a result of conversations we've had about how to get input from the broader community and community groups around the actual profile, so going that next layer deep into, okay, we know we're hiring a superintendent, but what do we want? What do we want to keep? What do we want different? What do we want the same? Um, we are starting a series of meetings that will kick off the week of December 14th. So stay tuned. Actually, early next week, um, Ben and I will be posting <laughs> the timeline for the next couple of weeks so folks can both see the process and the different steps and the places where they're invited to give input and the different ways they'll be invited to give input, including an online survey, as well as reaching out to Jim one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, so we are also trying to proactively communicate in advance of these things. Um, and that process will go through the first few weeks of January. Um, so hopefully we will give folks ample time to share their perspectives. Um, 
I think that's where we are at the moment. I'm not sure if I'm leaving anything else out that I should say, but, um, but stay tuned. And oh, one quick thing for the public. On our website now, there is a place to go within this. Is it in, Ben, can you, actually, can you come say where it is, where people sign up to get the regular updates? Because I think it's important for people to know that that's there. Mr. Lamas, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, so pretty, uh, you can get there easily from the homepage on the website. Anything that says superintendent search on the homepage will get you there. And there are, I think at this point, three different links. One in the, um, on the photos that scroll, there's a superintendent search banner, which is very big. And then on the quick links and the updates, which are a little bit further down the page, you'll see two links for superintendent, superintendent search. You go there, you'll get the current update, which is the hiring of Atlantic Research Partners, um, a, a sort of outline of the process, as much as we know now, and then also a link to sign up for further updates. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jackson. For those who are about to coordinate us, we salute you. Yeah. And thank you, Rebecca, for adding the fact that we have a storied history of citizen action. Uh, that that phrase, was that you? No, 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 no. No, I, I wanted to I almost had a thank, heart attack. We actually want somebody to come work here. So. I wanted to thank Rebecca for really making it very Brookline, the ad. Beautiful. I think that she did some great work in editing, and she deserves some credit Definitely there. Definitely sharpened up. My, whole, my husband told me not to have a heart attack about that we have a whole story to history of citizen action. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. But, okay. It was beautiful. All right. Any other questions or updates? Anything we forgot? I mean, all of you have been. Yeah, Mr. Glover. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh. Anything else on the, the superintendent transition that we forgot to mention? Okay. Mr. Glover. Um, just briefly, I wanted to update folks on the most recent Steps to Success uh, board meeting, which was um, November 18th. Um, a few highlights from that meeting. Um, there are three Steps to Success seniors that have been inducted into the National Honor Society, um, which is great. Congratulations to them, as well as all the other National Honor Society inductees. Um, as you saw on the calendar, the, um, the annual fundraiser Step Up for Our Stars is April 13th. Um, the uh, honoree is uh, Ken Goldstein, uh, former chair of the Board of Selectmen. Um, we got a great presentation while we were there on the Steps of Success College Success Initiative, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is a program that is intended to and does uh, work with students after they leave uh, Brookline High School um, in whatever uh, capacity uh, they choose to go forward, whether it's college or the workforce or whatever. Um, so it's not just college, even though it is called the, the College Success Initiative. Just a few statistics that came from that presentation. Um, we have a, a graduation rate of Steps to Success students since 2006 of, um, this is high school graduation, of 93%. Um, that compares to the general BHS graduation rate of, of 91%. Um, since 2008, there have been um, 72 Steps to, steps to Success college graduates. And the percentage of Steps to Success college enrollees who graduate within six years is 76%, um, which compares to the Massachusetts low income student rate of 14% uh, uh, very well. So I thought that was, um, that was pretty interesting. Um, and uh, the, so the, the program seems to be, be doing a nice job. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that the um, that Steps to Success is moving and, and um, is about to file, if they haven't already, their application to become a 501c3 organization. Um, for a long time, they, they haven't been. There's been a progression in terms of how the organization has been uh, structured. They have been for a while a, um, a Massachusetts charitable corporation, but that doesn't get you all of the same benefits that being a, a 501c3 federally gets you. Um, donors over the past few years have been able to get the tax benefits that a 501c3 uh, do get as a result of a um, 501c3 sponsor organization that uh, Steps to Success has worked with. But by um, going forward with a full 501c3 application and, um, uh, and hopefully acceptance, um, they'll no longer need that sponsor and it will sort of lower It'll make it easier for them to attract certain donors because even with that sponsor that they have currently, there are certain large donors and grants, um, large donors that wouldn't contribute in grants that they are not eligible for. Um, so it will help them in their fundraising um, going forward. I don't want to interrupt, but I have a question. But their funding structure, in addition to the um, 
the donations that they get, which obviously make a big difference, um, is through the ho housing and through the school department, correct? Yes. I, I believe that's correct. You're, you're going to quiz me on the budget and, and the revenue, <laughs> no, and, and, no, no, and I'm no, going to get it wrong. <laughs> no, I was just I, so I'm just trying to figure out how the 501c3 works in then. Maybe I just don't get it. Well, the organization itself is organized as a 501c3. The employees that are this is the way I understand it. The, the yes. employees that are funded um, are employees of the Brookline Public Schools or. Well, yeah, and even, even from even from the money funds that they may get in certain years from the housing authority, I think flow through the Brookline Public Schools. Um, others may know more about that, so mm -hmm. it's not as if that those funds are going directly into those coffers, as far as I know. Okay, all right, good. Moving, moving right along. Oh, sorry, Dr. Jackson. A quick, um, fabulous story. Um, I got a chance to attend the. Um, I believe it was specific to the high school, the high school's um, educators of color event um, earlier this week at the Golden Temple. Yeah. Um, per Elaine O'Sullivan's um, report out regarding our efforts to hire and to generate more of a diverse pool, um, Dr. Chris Vick, uh, Keith Lazama, Malcolm Cawthorn, Deb Holman, and probably other people I'm forgetting, Melanie um, Alexander were all a part of organizing what was an amazing event with an amazing turnout. There were approximately 100 people who flowed through the Golden Ooh. Temple between about 5.30 and 7.30, and there was a wonderful um, program where folks were asked to get to know one another and share their experiences. And I remembered because the one of the gentlemen from Steps to Success spoke about his growing up and his educational experience. Um, department heads spoke. Um, some of the deans spoke, um, encouraging um, the folks who were there to consider positions in Brookline as they come down the pike. And there were people there from Newton, from Boston, from charter schools, private schools, and other public schools. So it was a great event. And um, I hear we're going to see more of that, which is awesome. So just wanted to share. Okay, so just, no. Um, and I also uh, just wanted to report briefly um, from the 21st Century Fund um, board meeting. Um, which was uh, mostly a celebration of a very successful, um, it wasn't called a gala, it was called a bowlerama, but the bowlerama, um, they, uh, the, um, uh, the finances of it went, went wonderfully. Um, the feedback that they've gotten on the survey that went out to a number of people who attended was, was excellent. They had a huge number of teachers who were able to, to be there. Um, this year, and uh, the board discussed a number of different ways that um, that they might try to improve upon it. In addition to improving the food, which they everybody recognized was um, the the least successful part of the evening. But fortunately, the rest of the evening was so much fun that it it, it made up for it. Um, and it was certainly they were um, uh, they made above their targets um, in terms of what they had uh, budgeted for the evening. So that was all very good news. Um, we had a brief discussion of a preliminary set of things that the program committee is looking at, all of which will come to the school committee filtered through the 21st Century Fund's long process of, of reviewing new things. But one of them that they did, one of the things that the program committee is talking about with um, the headmaster is this uh, um, more uh, uh, out of the box thinking around uh, um, diverse uh, recruiting a more diverse um, pool of teachers um, and administrators uh, at the high school, um, and we talked a little bit about uh, our system wide interest in doing the same thing and just talked about how their efforts, if the 21st Century Fund gets involved, which it may or may not, but certainly how the efforts at the high school can be reflected system wide throughout um, our uh, our efforts to um, to address diversity in hiring. Great, thank you. Mr. Chang. Yes, um, I'd like to report uh, briefly. I attended the CPAC meeting on the 20th, and uh, Dr. Schmuckler was in attendance to provide some clarification on the, um, the partner, the parent partner program that I discussed uh, last month. And, um, you know, she provided a lot of additional input as well as um, parents being sensitive about uh, privacy, especially use of um, uh, Brookline email address. Uh, so I think that was really well uh, received and uh, you know, Dr. Schmuckler did a terrific job. And in addition, um, it was also expressed by um, Liz and her, uh, and her team 
uh, about the um, special ed para, which uh, obviously is a very timely conversation. And uh, I, you know, I think uh, uh, they may have something to talk about uh, in public hearing today. But it is timely, and this is something that we are actively working on it. You know, from from our vantage point as well. So. Thank you. Any other liaisons? I don't suppose anyone went to the race rails conversation yesterday, did they? I was on a flight. Um, anyway, there was another race rails at the high school last night, um, which was apparently uh, interesting, and I'm sorry I missed it. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, public comment, um, and I just want to note that um, public comment, um, there's a sign-up sheet there, but just to be clear, we are having the public hearing on the 9th Elementary School at 7.30, so if anybody wants to speak on that, I would really encourage you to wait until 7.30 because you will have the selectmen and a lot more people listening to you. Um, so is there anybody, would you mind just running over there and grabbing it, see if there's anybody signed up? Elizabeth, are you signed up? It's okay. It's, I'll just. Uh, if is there anybody on the sheet? Yes. Okay. Well, why don't we do this and then I'll just call on you. That's fine. All right. So we have three people signed up: um, Judy Myers, um, Alessandro Di Credito, and Elizabeth Mishka. Um, so Judy, do you want to start? Welcome home, Ms. Myers. <laughs> To our former school committee chair. A lot easier to be on that side of the table than on this. Um, I just want to ask you, and I'm happy to go ahead. Is your mic on? I have no idea. Yeah, it is. It's, it's green. 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 Okay, great. Okay. I should remember that. Given that this addresses specific policy language and statutory language, and you're going to be addressing the policy in a few minutes, I don't know whether it makes more sense to speak about it then. If not, I realize this is my time for public comment. I would just then ask everyone to take out the actions that they're going to be looking at. We're on, what, okay. number four, to take out number six, because okay. that's what I'm going to be addressing. And um, if you have so the- Robin's making copies. Yeah, oh, you're okay. if you have the So why don't you get started and The we'll language start. in front of you yep. will be easier. OK. Great. All right, sorry about that. I just wanted to oh, thank you. clarify. Yeah. OK. So, I am here, and it's it, we're, you're going to be talking tonight for a second reading on the admissions, the school admissions policy, what we also call the residency portion of the policy. And I just want to start out by saying that I really commend you for what you are doing. I am well aware. Um, I've sat on your side. I've been part of... Uh, working on this policy in the past, I'm well aware that we have to solve very real problems of overcrowded classrooms, limited resources, not to mention the fact that the disruption that occurs in our schools when um, children enroll in our schools for very short periods of time. Um, specifically, um, I think this issue comes up with uh, children coming from their, with their parents from foreign countries and uh, residing here for a temporary period of time. So that said, we also have state law which controls what we do and which was not written with Brookline's particular problems in mind. So the purpose of Chapter 76, Section 1, as I'm sure you all know, is to compel the attendance um, to, of, to school and compel the education of all children of school age. And then under Section 5 of that statute, um, it says that every person shall have a right to attend the public schools of the town where he or she actually resides. Okay, now the operative language here is actually resides. There is nothing in this portion of the statute that talks about living here temporarily or permanently. There is um, a reference to living in Brookline temporarily in the following section, um, and that's section six of the statute, um, and that's applicable um, 
uh, that's applicable to other situations, children who are living here temporarily, not with their parents or not, you know, where their parents, um, in the residence of their parents. That, as far as I have been able to glean, uh, Section 6 does not apply here. We are absolutely under Section 5. Okay. So, once we're under Section 5, if a child is deemed to be um, uh, actually residing here, we're under an obligation to educate that child. All right. So, the policy language that's being proposed and actually, um, let me, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get to it now. Um, and frankly, there was reference to this in the old policy that we've been dealing with as well. It talks about residence as a place where a person dwells permanently, not temporarily. This is not new language. We've had it in our policy before. Um, and I'm not suggesting that anybody's done anything by putting it in here this way. I'm just saying that when you take this language and then go right for, you know, right um, uh, later in the paragraph and saying temporary residence in the town of Brookline solely for the purposes of, of attending the public schools of Brookline shall not be considered residency, that does not apply that sentence does not apply to children who are here with parents from foreign countries. So we're back, um, we're back to, under the statute, you just have to show actual residency. Your policy now suggests that it's presumed if a student is residing here fewer, three months or fewer, the student does not meet the, el the, res um, the residency eligibility requirements. So it's a rebuttable presumption, but the burden of proof is on the student and his or her family to prove residency in the first place. So it's not about the length of time that a student's here. It's about the very real um, threshold of saying, I, we've come here to set up residency. Setting up residency is not all that easy. When I was on the school committee, I was part of a group. I don't know whether, I think I was on the policy of the committee. I don't even know, I think I may have been chair of the policy committee. <laughs> we put language in this policy specifically to say how you had to verify your residency. There were three categories. Category A, Category B, Category C. Sorry, am I running out of time? Shoot. Okay. And I, it's not easy to do. Okay. So, so let me just say, what I think may be happening here is that it's a matter of enforcement. Category A talks about having um, a copy of some kind of current lease or getting an affidavit from a landlord. That's fairly easy to get. But you also need something from Category B which is setting up, um, putting utilities in one's own name. People don't usually do that for one or two or even three months because that's, that's not something that you do unless you're actually going to be residing here. So I'm wondering if it's just the way we've been enforcing the policy, if we need a three months, uh, the three month threshold. So. I guess that, I mean, we're, I don't want to belabor that, but I will just say that the juxtaposition in the, in the current policy of the first sentence of the policy saying that residence is the primary place where a person dwells permanently, not temporarily, and then in that same paragraph talking about residing here fewer than three months. It's at least confusing to someone reading. You would think if you're coming to this district that if you're in that category, you're going to be out the door. So 
I'm happy at any point, and I would just say, if this is delayed, if the final vote's delayed, I am fa happy to have dialogue. This isn't something you lecture about. I'm also happy to talk to town council. We spent hours going over many policies together, and if she can convince me that I'm incorrect by okay. case law, I will step back. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Myers, and thank you for attending the policy subcommittee meetings and emailing the committee um, your thoughts as well. We, we appreciate it. Um, second uh, item, um, a second uh, speaker, um, Ms. DeCredito. So, and it's a, it's a five-minute um, oh, limit. Yeah, okay. we'll try to thank keep you. into that. Uh, all right, so good evening. I would like to bring uh, the attention of the school committee members to an issue that is of very deep concerns for the parents of children that attend the special education programs in Brookline. I do speak as a parent, but I also do speak as a liaison of the CPAC uh, for Ranko School. So I kind of hear <coughs> many other parents telling their stories. I do have a conversation with my colleagues, uh, let's say other liaisons, and also with the rest, the teachers, the, the staff. So the situation that has been actually now uh, active for the last three months is a practically chronic shortage of paraprofessionals in several classrooms in uh, different schools, but especially in Rankle, when I have a personal experience in. Um, there has been no uh, default from the side of the principals or the administration in looking for those, this personnel. They have been interviewing like crazy, even during the summer, in order to be ready for the start of the school year. The results of all these interviews have been to really find a number of candidates, good candidates that choose Brookline because it's a good school system to be and start a career if you want. But there are also uh, candidates who came maybe and or resigned just even before starting, or just resigned, uh, just said, oh, I'm sorry, I found something else. So they just disappeared before they started or disappeared a week after they started. So they kind of crumble in the hands of the teachers. This has created a situation that is extremely serious because some of these classrooms do have, I would say, a really uh, a sick situation of temps that do alternate day after day. So they cover the position. I mean, the children, children are not left unattended, but they are attended by people who see them the first time that day. The classroom teacher, SPED teacher, do not have the time to train them to teach the student and do not have the, tri the time to really be effective. Also, the qualification of a temp of the substitute are not as high as one that is hired with a good, uh, you know, uh, vetting process. So this uh, has created a number of problems that are ripple through, rippling through the school, and actually they do create problems in the classroom. These kids need support, and one of the supports they need are also behavioral nature that some of these parents are not able to provide if not properly trained. And Brooklyn provides training, but if you stay, if you are there for some time, not if you you know, show up and just disappear after a day or so. So we are extremely concerned as parents. And when we ask teachers or the paraprofessional, we do not talk to them directly. We do not have that particular contact. We are not allowed somehow to have this chatty situation. But if we interview, there are a number of issues that come out. Um, number of towns surrounding Brookline are also in the same difficult spot, but somehow we find ourselves in a more difficult situation. And one of the issues that is brought mostly is their economic treatment and the, a contract that they feel especially, and I know that this is a very hot topic, so I'm not trying to uh, push an agenda here, but there is a contract that is being discussed right now, and the economic treatment is definitely part of the issue. It's a tough market. Those, those, uh, these people can find a job anywhere else. The private sector is hiring them like crazy, so public school may be not the best place for them to be at this point, and we need to fight for the best. So I would like as a parent just to, you know, really press on, please do consider, you know, working on uh, uh, finalizing a new contract for not only the teachers, but also the paraprofessionals uh, in a very, uh, uh, let's say, speedy way. We do feel the weight of this lack. And uh, we do feel it on everyday life, and our kids feel it, and actually the school feels it. It's really a ripple effect. You can see it at every level. And unfortunately, that's not a positive thing. Um, there is not only that, we definitely want to make uh, the condition of the contract such that uh, a per person finds Brooklyn a desirable place to come and work for a long time. We used to have, I'm an old parent, so my child has been in the, in the system for many years. We used to have paraprofessional for one, two, three years. They were educated in Brookline and they became exceptional SPED teachers after that. 
what we see now is people who flee. You know, they come one month, two months, they flee. They're scared, maybe, tough conditions. I don't know what it is, but we're extremely concerned. So please just consider that the parents are concerned. We would like to have a strong contract, something that protects our kids with the help of professionals, that paraprofessionals that are high qualified and well paid. I mean, they deserve it. They work hard. Our kids are not easy. And I can tell you, I'm the mom. I wouldn't like to do that job <laughs> for so many hours in the morning. So I definitely am with that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ms. Mishka. Hi, Elizabeth Mishka, also a CPAC item today. Um, uh, around not just, I'm going to use devotion as the sample in the building process, in the design phase and the building, but this is now looking at wherever we renovate or when we go new building. And I've learned this through experience is the one elevator issue at devotion now for a thousand kids in the core doesn't fly. I don't know that it flies with the fire department for taking out people in wheelchairs. Um, if it breaks down and you answer, well, we'll fix it. We had a student who lost four days of school recently because we couldn't get the elevator fixed for four days. The parents were very happy to take the homework home, talk to the teacher on the phone, but that's not right. She couldn't get in the building into her classroom? Not good. I don't know how much elevators are. And I know that even the budget now for Webster Street is more money. But if you have a building with a thousand people in it, and the architect is probably saying, well, we can get through legally and the plea and the whatever, think about what is the right thing. It's, if it's as big as a football field, you're going to want to have a central elevator and you're going to want to have a backup egress near, you know, the drive up, drop off on the side street where everyone's doing, you know, the, the front door, yeah, but that side door is big news in the morning and afternoon. Why isn't there an elevator there? For anyone who visits, I'm bringing guest speakers in wheelchairs, two of them this week. Da -da 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 -da. I mean, you know, it's not, so elevators are like the basic, like the ramp. I know it's expensive, but in thinking of both Devo and thinking of anything else we go forward, very, very seriously. There's got to be a cheaper second elevator to go in. And there has to be made the space for these kids going up and down all day. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, it's on our policy to public uh, to comment on public comment, but, um, but thank you for coming. Um, that's all we have signed up. Is there anyone who else? Well, sure, of course, wishes to make public Sorry. comment. That's fine to say your name. Hi, my name is Mary Ellen O'Leary, and I'm a teacher at the Brookline Preschool at Putterham. Um, and I'm just coming to talk tonight about the materials fee, which I know is a topic. Um, last year, I applied for my children to attend Brookline, and my son did get accepted to the Baker School. Um, my daughters, there was not space for. Um, and I just want to start by saying how blown away my husband and I are by the education that our son is receiving. The schools are amazing. I love teaching in Brookline. Um, I believe in the system. I'm committed to the school system. Um, and I'll just give you a quick little story. My son the other day said, Mom, you know, my new school isn't like a school. It's like a fun place I get to go to every day. And as a parent, I was like, what? Wait, let me get my recorder. I wanted, I mean, it was just amazing to hear that. So, yes, it's unfortunate that our daughters didn't get a spot. It's been hard on the family. I'm not here to complain. I'm here to, to say how grateful I am and how wonderful the school is. I want to be here for a long time, and I would love for my daughters to be able to be part of that as well. So my opinion at the materials fee is, you know, we would love to be able to have all of our kids here. I know it's a hot topic and space is an issue, but just as a mom and as a teacher here, I just wanted to share that with you. So thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to make public comment? Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have an interim superintendent's report, Dr. Sure. Connolly. Item number one on the superintendent's report will be discussed under item 6B, so I'll jump over that for now. I'll go to item number two, which talks about the, the, the elementary principal search process. Uh, it's well underway. We, we plan to post the positions 
in the newspaper and in, in the other sites on December 7th. We, I have started meeting with parents and faculty in our schools that have vacancies uh, to form our search committees. I, I've had uh, a meeting with the Lawrence parents earlier this week. I have the Pierce parents tomorrow. I have the Lawrence and Pierce staffs uh, early next week. So the process is well underway. We hope to uh, have our search committees in place by December 21st. Uh, the deadline for the principalship postings will go until June 29th. It's an extended period of time because we hope to generate the strongest pool of candidates possible. So that means February and March will be the time that the search work actually takes place and the search committees will be very, very involved. Uh, we're hoping to have the uh, final candidates identified uh, by, the, by late March, perhaps the March 21st school committee meeting, if all goes well. And uh, I just wanted everyone to be aware that the search is in process. And if any parents or faculty have questions, please feel free to give me a call. We'd love to get everybody involved. That's our, that's our goal, to have everybody feel a part of this very important process. Question. Um, I'm a principal who want, is looking for a job, um, and I'm interested in a couple of the schools. Can you apply to more than one school? Absolutely. Yeah, we're doing four, potentially four separate searches. We'll have four separate uh, search committees, and if the search committees identify candidates that have applied for more than one school, they could potentially recommend those candidates as semifinalists. And the way the process will work is the 12 member search committee at each school, four parents, four teachers, four administrators, will recommend after an interviewing many, many candidates, perhaps three semifinals to be receive a second interview with the senior staff here at the central office and a few of the other town-wide officials. Uh, it's quite possible that if we get three from each school, we'll have a total of 12 candidates to, to look at. And there may be an overlap and have maybe some candidates that have finalists in more than one school. But through the second round of interviews, uh, if they surface as the strong candidates, then it would be our job to try to place them at the most appropriate school. Yeah, that, that was sort of the thought I had, that sometimes, you know, somebody might apply for one school, but are, you know, we know that from what their characteristics are, they would be a better fit at another school. Right. And, and that will take, hopefully take care of itself at the level two where we do the second interviews and the reference checks, and even site visits might be involved. Uh, so, so I think at this point, uh, candidates will be encouraged to apply for whatever school they feel is the right match for them. So, and, and one other piece that we've done in the past, I'm not sure if this is part of what's happening now, but usually the interview committees talk about the strengths and weaknesses of candidates, uh, but don't really rank order them. That, that's very important, Helen. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, as I meet with the parents and staff uh, prepping for this uh, process, I make that very clear. That if you, for example, uh, pass on three semifinalists, we're looking for you to identify, each committee to identify three candidates they feel would be successful at their school, that they could live with any one of the three. Mm -hmm. We do not want them rank audited because we want to, many times, you, you lose a candidate to another school system and you don't want the community to feel that they lost the number one candidate. So mm -hmm. we're looking for three, four semifinalists for a second round of interviews and then it'll be our responsibility to match them to the best school, to the appropriate school. Right, right, okay, great. Item number three is, uh, and I touched on it earlier under the capital report, we have a long range enrollment projection that we've been uh, working diligently on to, to further analyze. Uh, a detailed analysis of our long range enrollment projections has now been completed. This analysis identifies where classroom shortages by grade level in each school may occur over the next five or six years until a ninth school can be in operation. This information is valuable as it will provide the school department and Mrs. Simmons from the, uh, main, the, high, the building department with classroom need information by school well in advance of when it will be necessary to find, fill, that, fill that need. Uh, 
our enrollment projections continue to support the need for a ninth school, with a shortfall of as many as 30 classrooms between now and the school year 2021-2022. Clearly, until a ninth school is constructed, our ability to provide the number of classrooms needed to support our current recommended class size guidelines, which by the way, K3 is a max of 20, recommended. K3 a max of 22 and grades four to eight a max of 25 students per class may need to be compromised. For example, in school year next year, 2016, 2017 school year, our enrollment projections indicate the need for six additional classrooms in the following schools. The Devotion School, one additional grade five class, we have four sections, we have five sections of grade four going into four sections of grade five. Uh, that'll be taken care of because grade five is transferring to upper devotion and they have the additional classroom space. Heath, we're looking at the, the potential need for two classes, a grade two. Next year, we proje we're projecting 72 students in grade two. That would be three classes of 24. So the idea would, would be to go from three to four sections of grade two at Heath. In grade eight, uh, moving from two sections in grade seven this year to three sections, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm sorry, three sections in grade seven this year going into, into two sections currently in grade eight. We hope to make that three sections in grade eight. Uh, right now, we don't have a solution for Heath, and that's something we want to explore. Uh, Lawrence, we have a need for one additional grade four class, and luckily Lawrence has a classroom available for that additional grade four class. Pierce. We have an additional need for a grade three class. Again, it's four sections of grade two going into, into, into I'm sorry, five sections of grade two going into four sections of grade three. So we need to add a, a section in grade three. Uh, and, and we also do not at this point have a solution for that shortfall of one classroom that's being explored. And Runkle has a need for a grade five class. Uh, again, two, uh, three sections of grade four going into two sections of grade five drives a need for a third section of grade five. And luckily, Grunkle does have a classroom available. So right now we have a potentially a need for three or four classrooms next year. Because we've analyzed it so closely now, we have several months now to kind of uh, go visit those schools and work out solutions. Solutions could be uh, creating classes from existing space in the schools, uh, additional modular classrooms, additional rental space, and real, real, realistically over the next five years, until a ninth school is online, we'll probably have to face some increased cat class size. Uh, hopefully we'll keep it to a minimum. So that's what we're doing. And I think, uh, for example, next, next Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock, uh, I'll be visiting two or three of these schools with the building department to try to, to start that investigation of how we can best meet the needs of our space shortage in these next few years until we have a ninth school in line. And number four, any questions, comments? Yep, yeah, uh, Mr. Lauer. Sure, just um, Lincoln, Baker, and Driscoll, they're just even next year, no chance that there's yeah, there's, they, a, there's a uh, freeing right up now, of any classrooms yeah, right in those. Right now, uh, Michael, uh, the projections call for those schools to be, uh, have the same number, the need for the same number of classrooms they currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Baker just had the two modules put online, so that's gonna meet the need of Baker for a few years at least. But again, as this report points out that over the next five or six years, uh, that shortfall of 30 classrooms will impact all the schools. And we hope a ninth school will, will address that. Uh, another, yes, Mr. Beth. So, so one issue that Mary Ellen raised in the finance subcommittee, and it was also included in the first quarter report, is that similar to the constraints that we're seeing for um, our, our uh, classrooms that there are also constraints for special education classrooms that we may be bumping up against in, in our ability to expand those programs. And so similar, I, I find this very, very helpful. I think similar to getting a sense of, of the, the classrooms at the different grade level, it would be helpful to get a similar view and detail around what sort of constraints we're hitting up against for special education classrooms. Actually, Beth, that's something that David has, is the chairman of the capital subcommittee has asked for. And so Charlie Simmons and I will be developing that over the next few weeks to try to give give us give David that f the full detail. I, I um, commend Mary Ellen for raising that for us. 
but the other, the other the other side benefit of a of a ninth school would be that spaces right now that are being used for classrooms uh, that aren't full size classrooms will then be freed up for for these other specialty needs, and so. Uh, we're talking about a shortfall of maybe 20, 29 or 30 classrooms that a ninth school would address. But once that ninth school is online, it's going to free up space right now uh, that's being used for classrooms for specialty areas. You know, so it's going to solve many of our problems if we if we do get the ninth school. Uh, other comments. Number four, we have a winter and spring coaching position needed. Uh, in fact, Peter Peter Rittenberg is in the audience today tonight. He's at our meeting. He recently informed Mary Ellen Dunn and myself that uh, he would like to offer the following sports programs on a trial basis in school year 2015-2016, this school year during the winter and spring seasons, uh, a fencing program, a squash uh, sports program, and an ultimate frisbee program. Peter explained that he has a very large number of students that have expressed interest in these three programs, and he really feels that if we could offer these programs, it would provide a, a very worthwhile, positive opportunity for these kids in the late afternoon and during the winter and spring months. Uh, Peter indicates that budget-wise, the revenue that we would get from the, the participation would more than cover the uh, operational costs of these new uh, coaching positions and activities. And so, uh, I, I, based on this, this fact, and the fact we do have adequate funding, I plan to approve th these requests uh, as I feel it's going to provide that much needed uh, programs for these kids. And I really applaud uh, Mr. Rittenberg for taking the initiative to look for ways to keep the kids all actively involved. This is kind of an informational issue for the school because you're aware that we're bringing on new programs uh, on a trial basis this year. And we will, we will, we will make sure that the proper postings and, and uh, hiring procedures are, are followed. Yes. I just want to express my support for the decision to do that. As a new high school parent um, of a student who is an athlete, winter is um, a desert wasteland for him um, and for his colleagues. Um, and so I'm excited to hear that there will be some team options, not just training in the gym, singular options. And I think you know, another way to think about how important this is just has to do with the fact that we all struggle in the winter not to be sedentary. And I think it's really important for our kids to also be very active in the winter time. So I'm excited that these are possible to offer. So thank you, Coach. You go first. No, no, after you, ma'am. <laughs> um, so as a former high school parent, I certainly um, echo what Dr. Jackson just raised about uh, about sports. I have um, different questions about this, not so much about whether or not uh, it would be great to have these sports, but um, I understand that the that the user fee revenue would be generated. I just there's a there's a whole series of questions that we usually apply to new uh, programs, um, sports included, um, including the um, I know that there's been a lot of interest in these sports. I would be interested in seeing um, a breakdown of who's signed up for them, whether they were being equally, um, uh, whether they are equally accessible to girls as well as boys, whether or not we have a reflection of our um, student population signing up for them, and if so, um, what are the other costs of any of these? I know in terms of fencing, there is equipment to be rented. I wondered if that if that equipment is being provided to the students, if they're going to be expected to rent it themselves, if they're going to an off-site place to um, participate in any of these teams, um, or um, how they're getting there, how are we handling transportation. There's just a whole series of questions that I would love to see answered um, before just saying this is great, um, because I don't, I'm not aware of having gone through that process of asking and, and getting those questions answered. We did talk out and we did discuss a number of those issues with uh, Mr. Rittenberg. And uh, Peter, do you want to address any of those issues now? Or? So I might suggest we have 10 minutes um, to do 30 more minutes of um, agenda, which we're not going to get to. So um, Pete, if you want to, if there's anything you want to say, you should definitely come up um, and say it. If not, that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll we, um, or we, we can address yeah. it by email. Well, what we could do, Peter and I could work out these answers and, and I could share them on the 17th. Since you're here. 
Yeah. All right. So, I think we can provide. We have uh, information not at our fingertips right now, but I think we can certainly provide. Um, and I think very much to your satisfaction, some of these questions that you're asking. And I would just say in general that our goal, and we've been working on this for at least four years um, conceptually, is that we have burgeoning enrollment. We all know that. And um, we're trying to, f you know, the, the, we've seen in two years that the, the tidal wave of enrollment is real in the athletic department. Our programs are being subscribed more heavily and oversubscribed in some cases. Um, we are cutting many more student athletes than we would like to. We're creating more opportunities. And the goal in creating the opportunities is to not tax our current resources, both financial and physical, because we're running out of space. Uh, we're looking at plans that involve potentially losing gyms. So that's where the outside facilities come in, and they take an enormous burden off of our, uh, you know, the BHS resources in the winter because it's really all gyms, um, rinks, pools, etc. But uh, that's the general goal of it. And um, as Dr. Connolly mentioned, um, we want to make them budget neutral, um, to use our existing fee structure to create a theoretical budget and try to work within that so that it's not. Uh, taxing the, the town's financial resources. I don't know if that's unique, but it certainly is what how we uh, how our operational Peter, you expenses you can work. You mentioned yesterday that we have roughly you know between 40 and 50 <coughs> kids that have expressed interest in these two programs. Yes. Uh, do you have a breakdown of the gender involved? Yes, the two so the two winter sports are both at 50 and actually a little over 50 now. Uh, fencing is no cut. We can we can accommodate everybody. That breakdown is dead even, uh, boys and girls, which helps us because in our overall programs we do have more boys than girls. Um, but you know, obviously, if we can do an even, that's helping our balance. Squash is not quite there. I think it I think it was 38 and 12. Um, you know, we'd like to see that better, but this certainly uh, this certainly you know, a healthier number of girls in that program right now. Uh, ultimate Frisbee, we project to be not quite even, but um, more uh, closer to 50-50 break. <clears throat> I would also mention that these students, most of what we've looked at in terms of registration, a lot of students are not doing other sports in BHS, so they're really um, there's some new students at, to athletics, some pretty, some pretty interesting mixes of kids, and we're, we're excited about it. I mean, we'll see where it goes, but we're, we're very excited about what we're seeing in the early stages, just registration-wise. So I, I, mean. I think this is, you know, a fantastic thing to to start <coughs> new programs. And over the years, we've always, you know, had different sports that have come in, like women's <coughs> ice hockey and uh, women's wrestling and things like that 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 are different. But usually they start out, or some of the ones have started out as a club and not as a team that yeah. goes and plays other teams, and so the cost is much less. Is that something you're considering, it's, or is that not what this is? Well, we think, I mean, we certainly would consider it. I don't know what's coming along in the future in terms of sports, but I think that, that sort of thing has happened, particularly with squash, mm -hmm. that there has been a group in Brookline High School that's found places to play and practice and gain momentum and we were very fortunate uh, Windsor has built courts and we've got a relationship with them a facility relationship already and so there's there are five brand new courts it's a unique opportunity I think for us it's very close to our campus and, and there are other high schools who play these sports too yeah play not games. too many public schools but um, oh. We do have kids who are already participating in those sports, fencing as well, and uh, it's an opportunity for them to compete for their school, and I think that's also a good thing. Um, I, <coughs> I just want to remind people that fencing, the discussion about fencing started out last year, went on for a very long time because of some holdup in getting the coach approved 
I know you're looking. I, I know because, this well, book. am I correct that this correct, started right. last year? It went on and finally things worked out so that the fencing was approved, but at that point in time, most of the kids who were involved had made other, other arrangements. So that has been in the works at least for um, two years. What I like about this list of sports is they are outside of the usual range of what you see, and therefore they might appeal to a different audience than the kids that are always, you know, that you're seeing up, seeing signing up all the time, and I think that's a real plus. I just want to be clear that I'm, I'm not objecting in any way to the development of new sports. I think it's wonderful and I commend um, Pete and your staff for, for working aggressively on this. But I do think it would be helpful much the same way that we developed for um, foreign travel and foreign trips and out of state to have a form um, that's available that, that asks all of these questions to be answered um, as, these, as these new um, programs are developed so that um, so that Pete and others uh, in the position that you're in right now are not put in a hot seat. That's not the intention. The intention is simply to make sure that our students are um, well represented, um, their interests are well represented, um, and not to put a drag on creating sports um, like this or any other programs, but simply to make sure that the things that the, our core values of equity and safety and, and all of those things are, are represented in the development of the program. So maybe it maybe can just be taken care of with a, with a form that we use in the future. But thank you, Pete, for that. So um, are there any other questions for oh, Mr. Khan? Um, just on the note of the gender breakdown, um, something that's, I think, good about it and important is that none of, the, none of these sports um, are like, gender binary. And there's a number of students that I know um, who don't fall in the binary that are participating in these sports, and they haven't had safe opportunities to do sports before at the high school. So um, I think it's a very good opportunity. Good. That's a great perspective. Good. Thank you. Point. Anything else, Mr. Rittenberg? Can we uh, I mean, you? I will. We will. We'll work on fine-tuning some of these details you're looking for. But I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much. So we many, need to, yeah. we're looking at 90 and probably another, you know, it could be 150 between the three sports that we mentioned. So well, we're you. growing you new customers every day. So um, they are on their way. Get ready with your baseball mitt to catch them. Um, so we need to be upstairs in three minutes. Um, is there... Uh, we're going to have to come back down here. We have a half an hour more of agenda. Yeah, actually, the, the, the um, other three or four items are more informational. I understand. Yeah. But the, we have votes and have calendars and um, admissions policies and whatnot. So um, we're going to adjourn for now. Um, we're not going to adjourn forever. Uh, we're going to adjourn for now. We'll go upstairs. Um, we will have a dialogue with the public, or actually a um, one-way dialogue, as it were, with the public. And then we'll be back. All right, we are coming back into session, and we will be here as long as you want, um, or as short as you want. Um, Dr. Dr. Connolly was in the middle of his report, much of which I believe um, was informational in nature, but there might be some other things that, that are important to highlight in here. I just wanted to mention the, the MSBA webinar that is planned for Wednesday, December 9th from 10 to 12. We have three or four town and school department uh, people that have, well, have expressed an interest in, in joining us. There's room for others. We'll do it in the fifth floor conference room. But the important thing is it's talking about the whole MSBA process. And as we're waiting for the SOI response to high school and all these unanswered questions, we may find this very productive. So if you can make it, we'd love to have you join us. When is that? It's December 9th, 10 to 12. Right after college age. Straightforward. Notably, it's not just talking about the MSBA process. It's talking about the MSBA process with the director, the staff director of the MSBA. Mm. One just, other, just so everybody knows. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
additional comment one additional comment about MSBA. Uh, Mel Kleckner and I uh, penned a letter, a joint letter to MSBA asking for a meeting with them to talk about the high school issue versus the nine school issue, try and get some clarification what our chances are of getting both schools funded or if we choose to go with a high school being uh, through the MSB, MSBA process, uh, what, are the, what options do we have for the ninth school? And uh, we hope to have that meeting as quickly as possible, uh, ideally before the SOI ruling comes out on the high school. We oh, find, so. not yet, it, it, it's, been there, it's been there for maybe, Ben, uh, that letter, maybe they had it for about a week now. And the other two or three uh, things on the superintendent's report were just informational, except uh, Karen and Jennifer are right here. Uh, they attended these <laughs> wonderful, worthwhile uh, professional development workshops. I don't know if you have the energy to hear, hear a few few comments on it, but they were very <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> we have chocolate cookies if you tell us about your workshop. Yeah. I know. And all, all joking aside, it is an important topic, and if you want to tell us next time, that would be fine also. Okay. Or now. Okay. No, it's important. We do want to hear this. Lisa's um, effort around, um, they have a project called the Low Income Education Access Pro Project, which really is aimed at addressing some of the dispro disproportionality in special education that um, Deese is seeing across school systems. Um, I think as, as we've uh, spoken here before, um, we, are, we are and have been addressing the disproportionality in Brookline, um, which is at um, higher rates than many districts across the Commonwealth. So very clearly an important topic, and we're excited that we had the opportunity with the department and with staff to um, really dig deeply into the work. Mm -hmm. The only piece I would add is a, um, a little bit of uh, the Brookline flair that we're bringing to this work when uh, we're asking Kenny Kozala, our K-12 mm -hmm. uh, coordinator of performing arts, um, to really help us think about, as we learn Eric Jensen's work in terms of engaging um, um, students with poverty in mind, uh, how we can use the performing arts um, as a strategy to actually do that work. So we're excited about it. Anything else? That's your report. Any other questions for the superintendent? All right, seeing none, we will move on to um, school committee actions. Um, we have two. Um, one is the calendar. Why don't, Dr. Connolly, why don't you just do that one since you're up already, and then we'll move to uh, the policy. There should be a piece in your uh, packet at the, that was at the table with the calendar, and it was also emailed out in advance. Um, 
Item number one in the superintendent's report kind of summarized the two options, uh, but basically you have two options before you. Uh, both options, here I'm giving you my, my take on both <laughs> options. Both options eliminate the six hours or the professional development tracking, which has uh, the 183rd day, uh, we've shifted from working the 183rd day to having the teachers submit on a yearly basis how they used how they accumulated uh, up to six hours of professional development. Well, with 848 teachers in the system, tracking the submittal of those forms, making sure they align to the teacher's teaching assignment is just a, uh, an overwhelming task. And we've done a good use of their time or the, or the administrative time. And so th next year we're proposing to go with the 183rd day to be a professional development a full day of school. And both of these options uh, provide that. Both options have the last day of school on the same day, Tuesday, June 20th. Both options all, all include the 183rd day, as I just mentioned, as a uh, professional development day. Uh, option two has the grade K-9 students returning on Friday, September 2nd, whereas uh, option one uh, have the kids coming back on Thursday and Friday of that week, not just Friday. So it's kind of a, one of the concerns I have is bringing the kids back for just one day on a Friday. This year, for example, we had a thir we returned on a Thursday this year, so we had two days this year. Uh, option two also has Tuesday, November 8th as our uh, professional development day using, nat using the national election day on Tuesday, November 8th as the day we have the professional development uh, activity. Option one has it on uh, October 11th, which is between the two holidays. Uh, October 10th is a non-school day, and October 12th is a religious day. And so it would the kids would stay out for the five-day weekend, the staff would come back on a Tuesday and have a professional development day on that Tuesday. Uh, I think both calendars uh, have, have merit, well, for example, uh, not having the kids in school on the national election day, November 8th, I think is uh, something we should consider. Uh, we work so hard every day of the year to make sure our school, our doors are locked and the schools are secure. And on the national election day, I think, I think uh, six of our uh, 10 schools are used as an election site. The doors are open. We have you know, many, many uh, adult strangers walking through the schools. And so we, we really can't offer this as a secure environment on election day. So having that again as a as a teacher day, but not a student day, it has merit to it. <coughs> so I think uh, option one was developed by uh, the superintendent's office. It was shared with the teacher association and the uh, leadership team. Uh, it certainly has our support. And just this past week, after the, the uh, teacher association uh, considered option one, they come back with this option two as a as a second consideration. So you have before you two two considerations. Uh, contractual language allows this to be considered, and if by February we do not have a, a consensus opinion, then the school committee can can choose which option they believe is the best one. Uh, I've just had a chance to see this option two briefly yesterday. We're trying to get it in your packet for tonight. We can certainly uh, go back to the, the discussion table with the DEU and talk about the two options. We can come back on the December 17th meeting and maybe have a consensus option for you, but certainly this is two options for you, you as a school committee to consider. I think both options are viable. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have concerns about option two, but they both, they both have merit. Typically, this in a first reading, we would sort of have a first discussion about it and then take it away and at least attempt to um, get some clarity on what we might be able to do and then vote on a second reading. So if, if we feel like that's a possibility, we should pursue that. And if we feel like it might need more conversation, we should, we should do that and not bring it back for a second reading until we're clearer on. So, so, so I guess the, tonight would be about if people have thoughts or reactions that they want to give to Dr. Connolly um, for, for further discussion, then we can do that. Um, but we wouldn't bring it back for <coughs> a second reading until it's a 
make progress on that. But I wanted, I kind of jumped over by mistake. Uh, the option two has that Tuesday, November, October 11th as a non-school day for everyone. So the kids, instead of coming, uh, the kids would not be in that day anyway, but they, they, they would, they're calling for the staff to also not to be in. It'd be a totally non-school day on Tuesday, October 11th. And what they have done, by starting school on, on August 31st, you make up for that day. So they are willing to, to come back a day before September 1st, which is only, only they can approve that, uh, the day before September 1st, so to keep the last day of school on the same day, June 20th. Right, and I think, so I, I have a lot of reactions to this, but why don't we go around, Dr. Jackson? Um, I guess I just I have a clarifying question, and it's because I'm <laughs> half asleep, but, um, for either calendar option, we still accomplish the goal of having the full day professional development. Yes? Okay. Okay, so I want to just make sure that doesn't shift. And then um, Rebecca was whispering to me and I had the same question. October 11th is anticipated low student attendance. Is that because it's prior to Yom Kippur? Is that, what it, why is that anticipated a low? In, the, in, the, in between two, two days of non-school. So the sense is that many families <coughs> Weekend. If we took the 12. What's our Jewish population in Brooklyn? And how big is it to actually? Also teacher, teachers and students. No, I understand. I'm just trying to follow the. We, have, we closed school on Tuesday. Right. Tuesday. Yeah. So we're closed on Monday and closed on Wednesday. You don't have to close school on Tuesday. That's my. Yeah, your, your question is. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what, we, what the impact really would be. be. No, no, I get it. But here they're suggesting. We do close it, right, in their option? In both options. Okay. And then, um, and was there any concern about, I mean, if we're going to take election day, we should take election day. Why? Well, we actually considered uh, the October 11th or November 8th as the two viable days for the professional development. I see. Okay. They both, they, they both have good reason to choose either one. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else over here? Um, I don't have any immediate questions or, or comments. I, I need to look at this. There are some issues that um, raise some questions that we may be dealing with in collective bargaining, and so I would want to have a conversation with you about the following. Rebecca? I, I would just say that if you're thinking about low attendance, the starting school on the Friday before Labor Day is tough. Right. Mm -hmm. versus, versus having the teachers back Thursday and Friday, get the three-day weekend, start school on the Tuesday. A lot, makes a lot more sense. Right. Beth, I, I also just want to add a, another dynamic to think about, which, which is, you know, while on the one hand some of these days may be low attendance days, on the other hand, adding um, days off of school where the rest of the world isn't taking days off is extremely difficult for working families, and I feel like we need to balance those two things. So just on both of those, I mean, we did, so one of them is a question around, you know, does the 11th have to be off? And I think, you know, Dr. Connolly, I heard you say that one of the proposals originally was maybe the 11th should be the full day professional development day if um, so I don't know. If, yeah. I, I don't know what happened to that uh, idea. We, we feel strongly would would like to bring back the 183rd day as a PD full PD day. Also, as I mentioned, my oh, but as 11 as October 11th. Or October 11th or November 8th. No, I understand, but neither of the. I'm just. I'm just. Um, I'm right. So, so one of them is that it doesn't look like either one of these options has that one as the choice. Yeah, the yeah. the option two does. They use. Am I missing something here? Uh, no. November, November 8th, right. the election day, is right. the, the, the professional development day. Okay, so, so let me take a step back. I think one, one question would be, is October 11th as the 183rd day viable? We believe it is. Okay, so then that might be something to look at. I think the second thing that uh, that is coming out is just the – the impact, and we talked about this um, before, was the impact on working families of having three days off or even two days off when many other people aren't off, and what does that look like, and could we do something creative with the rec department or something to provide options? Um, so 
so we did we did talk about that. Um, but anyway, so, so I think that that's on the radar screen. So option one doesn't have it uh, labeled as, as well as it should. Uh, an option one, October 11th, is the professional development day. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. It doesn't say P on it. I think that's why I was confused. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. You want to keep going, Barbara? Ms. Um, I had, I had really had questions about having kids come back one day before Labor Day, and I think the attendance is one issue, <coughs> but <coughs> it's also, <coughs> excuse me, it's also from a teaching point of view. You have the kids one day, and there's. It's very nice when they get to come back the next day. They're a little bit used to things. But here you're having them come one day. You're putting a weekend in between. And it's almost like you're going to start again because, in fact, you are going to have significant absence probably because people will say, oh, well, you know, I might as well take the child out. It's the first day of school. What are they going to miss? So, in a sense, you'll end up having two first days because there will be a lot of kids for whom that Monday will be the equivalent of their first day. And I also think there's something very good about having at least two days when you start school together because the first day is kind of an introductory day and the next day they come in, they're familiar with it, you can get down to work. And then when the weekend occurs, um, and they come back on Monday morning, it, there's not, it's not so much a sense of newness. They're settled in a little bit. I, as a teacher, I wouldn't like this. <coughs> I think what I hear, there's a lot of variations on a theme that could happen here, um, you know, depending. Uh, I, I think what Barbara's saying is correct, and I like the fact that the <coughs> teachers were suggesting to start on the 31st. Um, and have those two days as their first two days. Um, I do, th and I'm wondering how sacrosanct ending on June 20th is. Can you end on June 21st, for That's instance, and then solve the problem that way? Um, you know, and then take out the second, start on the sixth for regular school, and then the the issue of the PD day I think could go either way. I think you know. I don't know, maybe we could survey parents and see what they'd prefer. Dr. Jackson. So just a couple other thoughts. Um, one, I'm curious why, why October, not why, whether there's another date other than October 11th that could still meet the, the idea you have here of getting the 183rd day. Um, and is there another option in the mix that we could consider? Because I do agree with Barbara. I don't know, maybe it's just because it's a, it feels more... Um, developmentally appropriate when I think of kindergartners, for example, like to have the first two days, I think actually is incredibly helpful. So keeping that, and could we jigger with the October 11th? Um, the other thing I will say is that I am not a fan of how late our district gets out in June. And one of the reasons is because we are way off schedule with camps and summer opportunities for kids. And so the only hesitation I have, Helen, with your suggestion of going deeper into that week is that most camps are not going to accommodate you, um, with the exception of Viking um, and maybe Brookline Rec. And so um, I think parents, what will happen, and it happens, it's happened before, um, kids will, the last day of school will be the 16th. Um, and so it's... It, camps start that early? They do. And, and it's, it, whether they start that early or not, it's also the middle of the week. Um, and so what happens is <coughs> it's difficult to purchase a half week of camp. Of and so what you'll have are parents who just pull their kids out. And so I, I hesitate around pushing us too far into what basically will be July. Well, um, just to add to that, I mean, actually, they, they really, really start on the 26th. But we are always into that week because of snow days. Right. So yeah, I think, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. So it's not that it ends, though, that can't no. end on the 20th. Mm -hmm. We will be there until after. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many snow days we're going to have, but you will definitely be into camp right. season. Right. So right. anyway, any other thoughts on this? I mean, I think. Is, it, is there any support oh, yeah, for – go ahead. I'm sorry. One other thought. I understand the security issues about Election Day, but I also think that it's really important for kids to see Election Day in process and to see people voting and to see, you know, the, the people, you know. It, it's just an important civic uh, experience. Um, I think, I think so. you see it as merit in both days. Yeah. Uh, 
to answer to comment on Jeff's comment about the just oh. looking for things for parents, you know, having a day off, uh, parents uh, looking for looking for child care. For that reason, we settled on October 11th, thinking with the long weekend, that might be the least disruptive to parents looking for child care, where there's no school on Monday, there's no school on Wednesday. They may have already made arrangements for child care, and rather than have the kids come in in the middle of the week for just one day, uh, compared to another day. But we still feel uh, we can make that professional development experience much more productive and much more exciting if we have the whole day. Is there anybody who is supportive of the idea of a Friday, September 2nd start? As the first day of school? First day of school. Okay, Ms. Stone. Just but I am. Sup I don't want it to start on the seventh. You know, if if the first and second are the first two teacher days, well, either way, it would, I guess. It, yeah, that's up to them. Then. So my okay. question. Okay. So, but just so you are hearing from the board, I don't think there's any support for starting on Friday the second. So, not if it's a singleton start. Date. Right, as a singleton date. Okay. Right. So my question <coughs> is actually about the. Um, I don't have the the contract in front of me. Um, we negotiated a ch I'm just wondering about the contra the statement that contractually this is allowed as long as it's not scheduled on days prior to September 1st. When we negotiated a change to that, and um, what I'm trying to remember is when that change was to be implemented. Is it not implementable here because that was a part of our... In your packet, you should have the contract page. But the one-year agreement oh. spoke yeah. directly to oh, the okay. ability to start uh, I earlier. The change was that you could bring the teachers back before Labor Day, but not the kids. Isn't that what was negotiated? No, because bringing the it might have it might have so been. That's why I'm. I, that's why I said I, I just want to know what the contract language says. Okay. Because because if it's possible to bring the teachers back and start the students on Thursday and Friday, then that's something we ought to be considering. Before Labor Day. So why don't we just leave that in your hands, which is to say... Do you want to read the contract again? Oh, do you have uh, it? Well, the, you have the one-year... This is the one-year? one-year deal that we did. Is uh, there a one-year here? Uh, the one current, well, the contract is defined. Let's let's yeah. let's yeah. look at that okay. afterwards. I'm just saying that if in fact we have a different, I got it. We got it. We got week, it. Then we should. Right. Uh, so <coughs> so here's what I'll say. Why don't why don't we leave in your hands somewhere between you and Elaine the idea of looking at the Thursday Friday before Labor Day, if you know if that works, but not as a singleton day. Is there any other big guidance that we want to give? Because otherwise, I'm gonna we're gonna stop this now and and turn it back over. To staff and have them come back. What? One quick suggestion. I'm not sure if it's possible to have the professional development day on Veterans Day. <laughs> it's a national holiday, but not everywhere. I mean, no. in many parts of the country, people go to school on Veterans I, Day. I would also, the only last comment I would have is that if, in fact, November 8th is being seriously contemplated and we are expecting full teacher attendance because this is a very important professional development day, it's mandatory, then I just don't want to hear from teachers, because this is a, teach, a PEU idea, I don't want to hear from teachers that because of this we are infringing on their ability as citizens to take a personal day and engage civically in a presidential campaign. So, um, I, if, right, well, but my point is that if that's what they want, then that has to be a BEU decision um, and a communication. Hmm? No, the point of great. Right, well, they can take an A day as is, but the point is if we are going to say that we want a mandatory, very important professional development day, they can still take an A day, but I think I'm just going to stop there, which is that if we see, because the union put it on that day, and then we see a tremendous number of A days on a very important professional development activity, that's it, especially if it's on race and equity and other things, I think there will be consequences to that also. That's all. So can we just give this back to you? Yes. Okay. So can I just ask one more question about going, so so the having a single professional development day was our model for mm -hmm. a very long time, and the move away from that was something that we voted to allow to happen to accommodate a different approach to professional development, and I just want to be 
um, I just want to be certain. I mean, I assume that since the staff brought this to us that, that that's been thought through, but I, I wondered what has changed other than the difficulty of scheduling that. So it used to be one day, and we then we moved to, to six day. hours, and now we're going back to one day. What's what? Is it this yes. Day? So it okay. used to be one day. Then uh, negotiations was such that it went to six hours, and the district can determine it um, not as a, a giving six hours over, but actually calling it a single day. That was the negotiation. It was yes, both of those in that same piece. That was something we sought because we wanted. That we sought to be able to claim that six hour, yes. Right, but we were saying at the time that the, that the single day was no longer serving our We needs. were not saying that. We were not saying that the same. I misunderstood. I thought, I thought that, that it was our position that we could, that the flexibility would offer give us the ability to have different groupings, that it would, that it would work better for professional development. But if you're saying that, um, that having tried that out, thinking that it would work, that it's we now believe that that single day is in fact better for professional development, and that's why we're going back in that direction. We are going to the um, to to claiming those six hours because we want to make it a mandatory day that every educator is present for a day of learning on issues of race and equity. Okay. So, so this 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 shift back to the full day was the administrative administrator's proposal to, to the uh, association. I think reading the contract, they realized that it's, it's our call for how we use that day. Mm -hmm. So they didn't come back and, and challenge that. Instead, they, they recommended other different days to be uh, to be used for it. Last comment, the birthday girl. Uh, uh, what I remember about the, that I remember something similar to you, but I think the issue was there were many choices that people could make, and the setting up of the professional development and the choosing of it was a problem. This, this now will focus on everybody, I assume, doing basically the same thing. That is to say, it's all thematically the same thing and by grade level or however you choose to do it. But when we used to have it, it used to be a potpourri of all kinds of different things, and that became what was problematic, I thought. It, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. not worth it. We all don't right. need to, but that was my recollection. All right. As long as it's aligned with district priorities, and this is a district priority this year, then we are good. True? True. Excellent. Nine zero. All right. So um, there are two more agenda items, um, and I will leave it at the discretion of each of the committee chairs as to whether we're going to do them tonight, given the lateness of the hour and the urgency of having them completed. Um, so, Dr. Jackson. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the urgency because I don't think I have a strong opinion about that anymore. Um, so maybe maybe what would be helpful um, for the policy subcommittee to keep moving would be just to explain where we are with this policy <laughs> and um, see at least where people are. Because um, I'm, to be candid, I've been struggling with how best to move this particular policy to the second reading for a vote, um, given that I don't know that we'll ever get to a place of perfection. Um, so this is a policy that um, we have been working on to address really three issues. One, as with every policy, we need to clean them up periodically. We need to check for language. We need to make sure we are in compliance with any existing laws. Um, the other was that as brought to us by Dr. Schmuckler, um, staff were needing support and guidance so to ensure consistency and fairness in the application of the policy. Um, and also just some greater clarity because as um, Judy Myers mentioned, and in many ways her comments I completely agreed with and are all accurate, there isn't case law actually to support our choices around this policy. Um, there is a definition of residence. We have not changed that in this policy. 
Um, we did, per our last piece of feedback, uh, expand what we called at the time a compassionate exception clause to make sure that uh, the superintendent and or his or her, her designee could could be flexible in waiving things like tuition and or residency. Um, and then we received a lot of strong reaction to the idea that we were setting a bright line for what would be considered temporary versus permanent. Um, and to Judy Meyer's point earlier tonight, and Ruth Kaplan, I believe, sent all of you an email with a lot of the similar perspective, we're concerned that, um, one, it would be challengeable um, uh, legally because there's nothing currently um, that says that's the way you should do it either at the state or federal level. There are lots of rules around visas, but this is not a visa issue. Um, and this is not an issue of fraud. We're not even trying to touch that issue because <laughs> we can't with a policy like this. Um, but the notion of putting forth something that suggested that there is a numeric date on which you say somebody can or cannot be considered a resident raised some concerns both about how people would perceive Brookline in terms of being a welcoming community and also whether or not we'd be open to legal challenge. We have met pretty extensively with council and in our last meeting, Mary Ellen, Karen, myself, Jocelyn, and Patty met again. Um, and at the advice of council, we included the language of presumption in an attempt to say something about the fact that the churn we get in our schools is about people who are here under three months. And the data supports that. And that if there were a way to signal to people that that raises our curiosity about whether or not you can adequately show residence, we thought it was worth trying to create some language that would be legally justifiable and also um, send that signal. So. Um, the subcommittee has read this many times, <laughs> and I think at our last meeting we agreed it was ready to come forth for a second reading. Um, in addition to Judy Meyer's feedback, Ruth Kaplan's feedback, I don't believe, just checking with Robin, we've received anything else on our website because we reposted again just to ensure that if there was another set of feedback, we got it. The only other piece of feedback I've received from somebody by way of a fellow committee member was that they looked at the original, they looked at this and said they were basically the same and they didn't understand what we were changing. That's the only other feedback I received. So um, I guess, you know, I would be thrilled to move it to second reading, but I also do appreciate that um, this policy, you know, it is what it is. I think it could be less confusing, more confusing. I'm not sure we're going to get to a perfect policy. I think Dr. Smuckler is satisfied with what we've generated, um, but I'm still very open um, if people have strong opinions <coughs> about it um, to revisiting it and continuing down that path. So, and um, either one. <laughs> right. My, I, I think this is better than it was originally. However, part of what stops me is this very first sentence, which is the definition of residency. Because, in fact, if you are thinking that, I mean, if you're thinking of a three-month cutoff, a three-month time, forget, forget the difficulties with that, then it's difficult to say that a resident is a place where, that is the center of his or her domestic, social, and civic life because that could be in another place, but that's not where the child is living now, so it might not be the center of his or her life. It might be the temporary center of his or her life. So that, p and I'm not saying to change it to say that, but that yeah. piece is what, I, what catches me. I, the, I like the term, the actual place where the child is living, which you do use later on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know about the three months or less because, again, if you establish some kind of, if you, as Judy said tonight, if you go to the trouble of getting a gas bill or whatever in, in uh, your name, you have all the paperwork. We have to admit you. So just to be, to, to be supremely to. clear, right? <laughs> to be as clear as I possibly, and, and I don't know how to be clear, because no matter what we do, no, nobody seems to, I can't quite get this right. This policy as it reads does not prohibit anybody from submitting paperwork to support residency. So the presumptive statement is a statement that is intended to signal that 
just renting an apartment down the street and being here for two seconds doesn't make you a resident in Brookline. You still have to show residency. So we are what we are trying to do in putting that statement in is to reiterate maybe, and maybe that is too confusing. We've certainly gotten the feedback to your comment, Barbara, that those two things seem sort of weirdly connected in that paragraph. <laughs> but that the, nowhere in here does it say um, you can't still prove residency. In fact, you can, and, and people do, <laughs> as I understand it from Karen. Um, so it doesn't prevent that. It is meant to give people pause to the extent that they might consider that without appreciating that they do, in fact, have to establish residency. Um, that said, you know, we didn't change the first part of this. Um, this is the original policy. The definition of residence is the original policy. We've not touched that. That actually does come from existing um, language from MASC and elsewhere, so we didn't, we didn't make that up. <laughs> now, it, we may never get it quite right, but that, the, but that has been the way that most of the policies we've reviewed have defined what residency is. Um, and I think, to your point, maybe there are ways to lessen some of the confusion, but, but that is the original language. Uh, uh, has anyone at MA MASC looked at this policy? Yes, that's original. MASC has reviewed the policy, and we have compared their policies. We've compared to Milton, Lexington, Cambridge. We've done a line-by-line -line analysis. Same. They all use the same definition, mm -hmm. um, and they all they vary on how much data they require. Some of them actually go much further than we do around things like visas, and we're trying really hard to not conflate this with some of the immigration pieces of this puzzle. Um, but and some of them do actually use language like temporary, um, but um, everybody uses it, and it's because it's coming out of MASC. I think people lift it out of their policy. I mean, I like the second this. I looked at this one. I looked at the previous one. I don't see much of a difference. The amount of brain damage that came out of these things were, were so beyond the point of, you know, additional diminishing return. Let's, to me, this is, it's, it's telling that the one version to another hasn't materially changed. You know, how many people have spent time on this? What does that tell you? I'm not sure, Ben, but I will tell you this. I'm, I'm really not sure anymore, but um, I used to think I knew. But um, Karen, Dr. Smuckler and her team are keeping amazing statistics on our churn and on our residency and what the, and, and, I, and we will continue to do that. And so I do think if we were to move this forward and pass it and implement it, um, we would be in a really good position to be able to say, did this have any consequence at all? Has there been any real change? Um, we aren't looking for exceptional change. We are looking for staff to feel a little more comfortable that they have something that works for their ability to then engage their procedures. Dr. Smuckler, Dr. Smuckler sorry, <laughs> seems to feel that this does that to some extent, um, and so I think I do think it's worth a try, at least in that regard, and if we could track the data and revisit it, maybe in six months. Uh, you know, we don't have to wait a whole year. We'd be happy to do that. And my, my sense, um, Mr. Chang, is that the reason this has taken so much brain power is that it is a place not it, where it isn't just rearranging words and deck chairs. It's, it's running up against values questions. And when that happens, every change, every period and comma matters. And so whether or not it's a good use of time, I think that's probably why it got so many people. I mean, we had former school committee members who were lobbying us nonstop, emails, voicemails, phone calls, committee meeting after committee meeting after committee meeting. I mean, this one has touched a nerve. And so I think the question is, if it, if it does what our staff wants, Exactly. So okay. my point here is this is not engraved in stone. If it doesn't work, we'll come back and revisit it based on things that's not uh, it's not functioning for us. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion. But can I just say something, Ben? Further discussion. Um, can I say one more thing? Further discussion. Yeah. But just, uh, so that first line, there's a reason for that. And that has to do with it. there can be somebody who resides in Brookline part of the week and resides, has their residence and where they do most of the things in another place. And that's, that's part of the problem too there. I mean, that's one of the things that our attendance officer tries to check to make sure the kids are sleeping here in Brookline. The ATV has turned off my microphone, so um, <laughs> we're, we're wrapping up. Um, I think it's, uh, the, it's so, the battery. Um, I want to clarify one thing that came up um, 
in conversation, which was that um, given the sensitivity around uh, refugees, particularly at this um, time, that um, that uh, somebody asked me whether or not this would be uh, seen as a sign that that we would not, you know, be welcoming. And and I just want to point out that the compassionate exclusion that we put in deliberately covers anybody here uh, under under that status. Um, the second thing I just want to I just want to point out that I believe that Judy Myers was making a point about the law and the differences in the legal statutes as they are reflected or not reflected in this policy language. She has pointed out she has pointed out something that does exist as a bit of a contradiction given what I understand about the statute. I don't believe it is an obstacle to our implementing this policy, but I do believe it's something we should take a harder look at as we are doing our due diligence to make sure that the policy is written in a way that is consistent with um, the statutes that govern, that govern our requirement to serve anyone who actually resides in Brookline. Is there any further substantive discussion? I guess I, I am just confused about that because I, as I understood what Dr. Jackson just said, that, that legal counsel actually said that we were okay with this as written. And so I just would like some clarification. It is like, are we okay or are we not okay? So we are okay in as much as we are saying that to be educated in the town of Brookline, you have to reside in the town of Brookline and we give a definition of residence. In that regard, we are fine. What the law doesn't do for us is when we start to use words like temporary or where we start to put in something like, which is why we chose the language presumed, is that, is that the law doesn't help us with that. The law, we're, we're taking our own sort of course and trying to say, we're not saying you can't be here for three months and the law doesn't say you can't prove residency in three months, which is why legal counsel gave us that language. Are we open to legal challenge? Yes, and we were before. I don't think we are anymore based on what at least I understand from counsel is the law. But now I'm going to turn to our lawyer. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the counsel who, who has studied this in depth. But if I remember correctly, I mean, the problem with the statute is it lacks a lot of specificity in terms of what the intent of the legislature was. If you, if you, if you take it to its extreme conclusion, if someone who lives here for five hours under the statute, is that the intent of the statute for them to be a resident? So there's, I mean, there's, I don't think that's, anyone would agree that that's what it means. So if you want to give it that literal interpretation, then maybe you agree with what Ms. Meyer says. But I think, I don't, I don't think anybody logically thinks that's what it means. And there's a certain amount of leeway as well in terms of establishing. So again, only, is. only to be fair to, to Judy and the research that she did, the statute does not establish who is or is not a resident. The statute compels us to provide a free education to children who actually reside here. So the only, the only thing anyone has to do to have access to a public school is to prove residency. We have a policy that sets out how you have to prove residency in Brookline. It does not require you to sign an affidavit that you plan to be here for more than three months, which is why we were careful, as Dr. Jackson has said repeatedly, to say it is presumed that if a student is residing here for three months or, and it should be changed to fewer, frankly, not that less, the student does not meet <laughs> resident eligibility requirements. If someone comes in and says, we intend to be here for fewer than three months, that is a declaration that we can now point to and say, this policy pr makes the following assumption. If they, however, simply come in and prove residency based on legitimate documents, they are admitted to the public schools of Brookline. Okay, so I am going to call the previous question uh, because you all want to talk, but you're going to blame me at how late we are, um, and I serve at your pleasure. So um, is, we're going to vote on this. Um, all those in favor? All right. All those opposed? And we have one abstention. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for shepherding us through this. Thank you, Ms. Doan. Thank you, Dr. Schmuckler. Ms. Dunn, um, extend our thanks to town council. Um, and it might be worth somebody sending a note to um, Judy and Ruth 
and just letting them know. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Dram, is there anything, given that no one is here except all of the people who have already talked about your report, would you, is there anything you'd like to say? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was going to say that the only benefit, I mean, b given that seven out of nine of us right. were at the meeting yes. where we discussed this and the report has not changed since right. we discussed it, the only benefit of discussing this is for the broader public. Right. And so I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> that they're not here. Right. right. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, we are going to defer this to um, the uh, December 17th agenda, uh, Ms. Coyne, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to assume there's no new business, and we are going to adjourn just shy of 11 p.m., Mr. Chang. Um, thank you all for your patience. Thank you to our uh, tireless staff for, for staying here.